every day there is a new asset that's being created. If it's not Libra, then it's uh, it's uh, the gram for Telegram uh, and so on and so forth. You know, all these are um, you know taking life right now, but it's still very early. All these projects are very new, very early. Tokenization of financial assets is also very early, but it's a big promise for the future. But all these projects have one thing in common: is they will need security, they will need governance, and they will you know they will have to be make. Uh, easy to use. Today I talked to Pascal Gauthier on the Speaking of Crypto podcast. I'm your host, Shannon Grinnell. Want to learn more and be inspired by crypto's front runners who are out on the leading edge of this technology? Well, you're in the right place. Welcome to the Speaking of Crypto with your host, Shannon Grinnell. Pascal Gauthier, CEO at Ledger, talks about how to save your Bitcoin using Ledger's cold storage wallet. We also get into governance around the ownership of crypto and business and why we need to be patient with where things are at with Bitcoin and crypto. This is episode number 91 for the Speaking of Crypto podcast. We also talk about UX improvements that are still needed at Ledger and in crypto in general. We get into Bitcoin ownership and responsibility and SIM hacking, the Liquid and Lightning Network's facilitation of Bitcoin transactions. But before we get started, a big shout out and a huge thank you to our show sponsors. Today's show is brought to you by Ledin. Ledin is Canada's leading Bitcoin financial services company, offering a suite of services to help you save in Bitcoin. Ledin's Bitcoin-backed loans let you access dollars without selling your Bitcoin. Ledin's Bitcoin savings account also lets you earn 3.5% annual interest, compounded and paid monthly in Bitcoin. Learn more at ledin.io. This episode is also brought to you by Stark. Stark's payment system allows your online business to accept Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies without restructuring your existing technology. Join the new era of the internet. Find out more at starkpayments.com. Want to earn free Bitcoin? You can with Lolly. Lolly makes it safe, simple, and fun for everyone to own Bitcoin. Earn up to 30% back in Bitcoin rewards when you shop online at one of Lolly's over 500 top retail brands. Join for free at lolly.com. Well, Pascal, I should say enchanté. Very nice to meet you. Um, Je peux parler un peu de français, mais je dois pratiquer um, si je parle beaucoup, beaucoup, I guess. (laughs) Non, c'est parfait, Shannon. Really good friend. uh, I I went to um, Montreal when I was uh, 17 to learn how to speak French, and I lived with a French family. And I just loved it. It's such a beautiful language. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's, um, I was at the point where I was dreaming in French, so it became very natural, but uh, I really have lost it. Okay, well, you know, maybe uh, one day uh, you'll find the time to, uh, to work on your French again. Yeah, I'll have to come back to France and visit and, and spend time there as well. For sure. Anytime you want to come, Ledger is here. <laughs> you are based in Paris, is that right? Yes. Oh, it's fantastic. Um, well, Pascal, why don't we dive into Ledger a little bit? Um, I'm really curious and, uh, you know, I have a whole bunch of questions, but um, I'll start by asking why, like, why do you, why do you suggest that people put their Bitcoin on a Ledger? I have one in front of me and um, as opposed to, let's say, leaving it on a crypto exchange or in a wallet on your phone, what do you think the greatest benefit is? Sure. I mean, one word is security. Um, the other way of saying it is uh, not your keys, not your crypto. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so basically, it's a decentralized value proposition that brings you ownership of your private keys and security. Um, if you leave your keys on an exchange, uh, if you give your crypto to, to an exchange, it means that like, you don't own your keys. And so therefore, you don't really own your crypto. You've, uh, you've used a centralized value proposition to keep your cryptos for you which maybe is good, you know, good enough for you. Like, you know, it's a, it's a personal choice in the end. Mm-hmm. But if you want uh, the uh, economic freedom that crypto brings to you, then you need to own your private keys. And when you own your private keys, you need to do so in a very secured way. Because, of course, if uh, anyone has access to your private keys and they have access to your cryptos and then you've stolen um, your, your crypto, so they can st- steal them from you. Uh, and so, therefore, uh, owning your keys, we believe, is a uh, uh, core of, of a value 
proposition, but with absolute security. Yeah, so I, I think it's, you know, part of the Bitcoin philosophy um, that it's really important to have this system that lives outside of um, government, especially in corrupt government situations, um, and really to take back ownership of our own, you know, financial situation or our own money. Um, I, my question is, you know, what about what happens if I lose my ledger key, my little my key that I'm holding on to right now. Um, what do you call this, uh, this USB stick? A hardware wallet. What, yeah, so if I lose my hardware wallet, right, um, then what happens? Sure, so like any decentralized value proposition, you have uh, two things. You have your hardware wallet and or your wallet on the one side, and on the other side, you have 24 words, which is your recovery password. Um, you cannot lose the two at the same time. If you lose your hardware wallet and your 24 words, then you've actually lost access to your private keys and your crypto. If you lose your hardware wallet, it's easy. You take your 24 words, you can reorder a hardware wallet and uh, reinitialize it with your 24 words. And so, you, voila, you have access to your coins again. If you lose your 24 words but not your hardware wallet and you still have the PIN code, of course, you can log on to your hardware wallet and then transfer your coins into uh, to a different address where you have the 24 word uh, password. Uh, so this is how it works. And back, back to ahead. your point that you were making, I think, uh, you know, the philosophy is that today in the digital world, users don't own anything, you know, your data belongs to Google or Facebook. Uh, what was very new with crypto is suddenly you can own your private keys. And so you can own your money. And we believe that in the future, you will go beyond crypto and uh, there will be what we call critical digital assets that user will be able to own and then delegate. So what we do at Ledger is to, our vision is this, and our mission is to provide a secure and easy to use uh, solution for people to own their critical digital assets. That's very, very interesting. Um, well, what I do love is, um, you know, for someone who's living in a situation, um, I've spoken to Mauricio from Ledin a few times, um, and he's from Venezuela. And to be able to, as you're saying, without my hardware wallet, cross a border just with knowing my 24 words and still have access to my crypto crypto as I go from one country to another. If I'm a refugee or I'm just, you know, leaving a country and be able to take it with me, I think is incredibly empowering. Um, so it's fantastic that way. And what you're saying in terms of crypto assets, where do you see things going? What types of crypto assets? Um, are you talking about, you know, real estate that might be, um, you know, in an STO or is it um, non-fungible tokens? Where do you see things going? I mean, I'm just going to paraphrase and repeat what you just said. I mean, you know, there is a, I think, you know, the, the, the revolution started with Bitcoin. There was an underlying technology of Bitcoin, which was blockchain. Now that blockchain technology and or, you know, different protocols are being built using the same type of technologies. And so whether it's a security token, whether it's a non-fungible asset, I mean, there are many uh, of those digital, critical digital assets that, be, that will be created in the future. And the question is, do you delegate ownership to a third party? And so therefore, it's yet again centralization and a single point of failure. Or do you want to uh, have that ownership with you or share the ownership, which is also a possibility. Um, and I think uh, what we see today is, you know, even with the announcement of Libra, uh, we see that the technology that was first brought to life and to the light by, by Bitcoin is actually used now in many different projects, uh, and uh, those projects will, par will power like the tokens of the future. And those tokens, again, you will decide to hold your Libra tokens or not. Uh, uh, but uh, you know, and every day there is a new asset that's being created. If it's not Libra, then it's uh, it's uh, the gram for Telegram, uh, and so on and so forth. You know, all these are um, you know taking life right now. But it's still very early. All these projects are very new, very early. Tokenization of financial assets, it's also very early, but it's a big promise for the future. But all these projects have one thing in common, is they will need security, they will need governance, and they will, you know, they will have to be make uh, easy to use, uh, sort of. Yeah, um, and what assets are you currently um, accepting on Ledger? 
Well, actually, quite a lot. We uh, there are over a thousand uh, uh, tokens that you can uh, that you can uh, use having a Ledger Nano S or, or Nano X, uh, and uh, we try to integrate as many tokens as possible uh, for users to be able to use them either through the Ledger Life platform and or any other third party software that is compatible with our products. Yeah, I currently have the Ledger Nano S, and what's the difference between that and the new the X? There are two main differences. Uh, the Nano X, you can connect to your phone with uh, with Bluetooth, uh, and uh, so you don't you don't need a wire between uh, your uh, phone and your Nano S previously, or uh, or your computer and your Nano S. So you can connect through Bluetooth, and there is more space uh, on the Nano X. Hmm. Uh, the Nano S, we had a few criticisms where people couldn't have like more than a certain number of apps running on the phone. So basically, with the Nano S, you can have anything between four and seven apps, depending on the size of the apps. Uh, but with the Nano X, you can go up to 100. Uh, so the space is, uh, is something very different. And it's a testimony to the fact that people are using much more coins in 2019 than they were in 2015 when we uh, uh, first uh, created the Nano S. Uh, and so therefore, the space on the device and the number of apps that you can run at the same time has become something of interest for consumers and the Nano X is the answer to that need. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, now, who are Ledger's biggest customers? Are they, um, are they crypto companies and crypto whales or regular crypto holders? It's all of the above. Again, I think we have uh, two, two products, the Nano S and the Nano X. That's more for an individual usage. Uh, mm -hmm. So individual usage means that either you're a consumer, you're Sometimes you're a prosumer, you're well, etc. But you know, only one person wants to have access to coins, um, or you're in an organization that really trusts that one person with all the coins. And then, if you are not really trustworthy of your partners, then you can uh, you can upgrade to uh, to the Ledger Vault, which is the product that we've designed for enterprise, which basically says that sometimes you have those coins or those funds where multiple people need to have access. So you need to handle the governance on top of the coins, and that's what the Ledger Vault product does brings you security but governance. So if That's you really I, interesting. Yeah, how does the governance work? Yeah, but let's say that uh, you and I and then we have another partner have like a hundred million in Bitcoin. Uh, I mean, who's got the private key? Is it you? Is it me? Mm, like, is right. it partner and Ahmed? We trust each other with a hundred million. Um, uh, so, and, and outside of trusting each other with a hundred million, our LPs or the people that would have given us the hundred million, how much they trust us, you know, they, they need some proof that we have some form of governance, so we don't have like uh, an access to the funds, and uh, and we can go to Costa Rica the next day. Um, so, the <laughs> however the nice that would be, <laughs> yeah, that would be awesome. Uh, <laughs> but uh, that's what governance is. Uh, it's uh, it's rules, uh, business rules on who can access the coins in what circumstances for what amounts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, you know, if I want to simplify, uh, Ledger S and X. That's like a, a, a digital safe, like like a safe that you can put at home. Mm -hmm. The Ledger Vault is like one of those big safes that sometimes you see in movies. Actually, you see one in, <laughs> die, right. in die Hard, you know, the movie Die Hard, <laughs> yeah. the safe that they're trying to crack that has multiple locks. Right. But the difference is, you know, they won't be able to crack Ledger Vault when in Die Hard they crack the safe in the end. But, uh, <laughs> but Stronger uh, than, the, than the Die Hard safe. Uh, better than the Die Hard safe, but uh, but it's the same. Uh, if you want to picture it, it's like little safe for individual use on one side, and more complex safe with uh, um, you know different different level of access and uh, uh, and and uh, and business rules and governance rules that are enforced by by the safe. Again, the big difference here is the safe will uh, send and receive money, and the way that the safe send and receive money is uh, the rules are all enforced by the technology. Very interesting. So the governance is within like a smart contract, I guess. Is that right? No, that's not right, actually. Mm. Uh, we don't do it through the protocols. We do it uh, with the hardware. So what Ledger does is very unique in the space, is that every business decision is enforced by the hardware. So it oh, means interesting. that you can have uh, the same business decision, same business rule applying to any crypto uh, that the vault manages enforced by the hardware. So any crypto is the same. So if you want to have uh, uh, three people signing for a Bitcoin transaction or an Ethereum transaction or whatever coin that is supported by the vault, 
is the hardware that will enforce the signature. And so meaning that uh, those protocols that don't support uh, multi-sig actually yes. have multi-sig through the vault because all those business rules are enforced by the hardware. Very interesting. Oh, yeah, it's really fascinating that you have that differentiation. It really makes sense um, to have something like the vault um, for businesses. I, I was thinking if I wanted to, let's say I'm looking ahead to the future and I want to give some Bitcoin to my children and my nieces and nephews, um, what do you suggest? Like, would you recommend um, giving them each um, one of your hardware wallets and, you know, sort of keeping that for them? Or what's your suggestion around that? Hmm, that's a great question. Um, I think it's a tough question. I think right now, um, the governance that described for the enterprise business doesn't exist yet uh, in a ledger product for the consumer business, mm -hmm. but it's something that uh, that we're working on for 2020. Um, so before giving the Bitcoin, I probably wait that the same type of governance uh, exists for 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 the consumer product. Uh, but uh, but right now, um, you know what I've done. I can tell you what I've done. I, what I've yeah. done for for my son and for my nephews is. Uh, to give them crypto, but I keep it for them. So they have a paper that say they have an IOU uh, and oh. I keep the crypto for them. Right. Oh, it's a nice way to do it. Um, yeah, because the other thing that I wonder about is, um, you know, having this hardware wallet, it's, you know, it's an important device in order for us to be empowered to, to hold our own cryptocurrency. But at the same time, it feels so valuable that, I mean, depending on how much you have on it, um, that I wonder, you know, would people want to store it in a, um, you know, a safety deposit box, <laughs> in which case you're going to the bank, which kind of defeats the purpose in the first place. Um, so where do you recommend putting your hardware wallet for safekeeping? Well, well, you, the, the ledger hardware wallet, you can keep it in your pocket, you can put it in your chimney, uh, you can pretty much put it anywhere because it is a secure piece of hardware. Uh, where even if people have access to it uh, right now, they cannot open it. Um, so when I say right now, it means that security evolves over time. So if we stop right. working today, eventually at some point, you know, an attacker might be able to find a flaw in our security scheme. So which is why we invest in security, which is why we have a hacker, hacker team internally that hacks the product every day and try to find flaws before anyone else find them. Hmm. Um, so security is a constant investment. Uh, it's not something that you do one day and then voila, it's done. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to, uh, you know, technology evolve on both sides. So attackers also evolve. Uh, and so defenders have to evolve faster than attackers. Right. Uh, but in theory today, you can, you know, you can, uh, if, if you forget your Ledger Nano S or Nano X in a cafe, nothing will happen to you. You just need to retrieve your 24 word password and then reset like a new device. Uh, and uh, and you're fine. Uh, if you're not comfortable, you can always uh, uh, you know uh, send your coins onto uh, like a, a new address with a new 24-hour password if that makes you feel better, uh, because you don't want to give you know sort of uh, enough time to attackers to eventually break the device. But today we're comfortable to say that uh, nothing much will happen if you forget your device on the on the table in a cafe. Want to do more with your Bitcoin? Try Ledin's Bitcoin savings account, which pays out 3.5% annual interest, compounded and paid monthly in Bitcoin. Want to diversify your holdings, start a business, or buy more Bitcoin? Access a dollar loan while maintaining ownership of your Bitcoin and potential upside. For more info, check out Ledin.io. Want to take your business global and add new revenue streams for your business? Stark can help. Stark's payment system can guarantee you discounted transaction fees, as well as a suite of blockchain payment tools, including real-time transaction reporting. Find out more at starkpayments.com. Want to earn free Bitcoin when you shop online? It's easy with Lolly. Shop at one of Lolly's over 500 top retail brands, and you'll earn up to 30% back in Bitcoin rewards. It's like getting Bitcoin for free. Sign up at no cost at lolly.com. 
Now, Pascal, what do you think about Bitcoin? We're talking in this series about earning, saving, giving, and spending. What do you think Bitcoin's greatest role is? Do you see it mostly as a store of value these days, or do you also see it as a medium of exchange and unit of account? Um, well, I think usually I've got a I've got an answer for you that goes something like this. I think. Um, there is Bitcoin today and what Bitcoin will become. Uh, I think people are asking a lot about a very new technology. So even if Bitcoin was created in 2008, we're only sort of 11, year, 11 years in, but and it's a lot and it's not much. Um, I mean, in terms of technology now, everyone, everywhere, everyone wants things to go faster. But Bitcoin has a big job to do in order to become uh, something uh, <clears throat> dominant because you know, it is it is a new technology that has to deal with regulation much more than other type of uh, sort of uh, free technologies that have that have seen the market before. I mean, I don't think that uh, the regulator care much about the internet uh, at the beginning of the internet. Uh, it's you know, mm-hmm. regulators uh, regulators had an issue with Facebook last year. So uh, <laughs> right. Um, so okay, uh, That's a good and point. so. You know, Bitcoin is, uh, is is different in that regard, and so maybe uh, because it's touching finance and our financial assets, of course, regulation is is a big hurdle for for any um, innovation to sort of come to the market. So I think we need to be patient with with Bitcoin because of this. We need to be patient with Bitcoin and every other cryptocurrency because of uh, the nature of the technology, which is a very difficult technology to bring to market. The it's a uh, um, the way that the technology is being built and is being built on consensus make it sort of slower than if you have one company deciding for you know every feature, um, and so and so Bitcoin is still very young, and so what it will become is probably will become everything that we say will become. So you know sometimes when you see something, you know it's the best way of making something happen. So people say it's a store of value, people say it's a mean of payment, people say many things about Bitcoin. It will, and because people think that about Bitcoin, it will probably become that over time. I just think that uh, I just think that we need time. That's really interesting. I love that you just said. When, sometimes when you see something, it's the best way of making things happen. Um, I really do believe that when we have sort of this vision of you know the future or how things will go, it's you know it helps for it to be implemented. Um, so I agree with you. I think, you know, Bitcoin will be something much more than it is now. Um, but what do you think is in the way of mass adoption? I, I don't know that for with Bitcoin, it's regulation as much as maybe with Libra or with some of the other the cryptos. Um, but um, but what's stopping mass adoption from happening with Bitcoin or other cryptos? Well, I mean, we we say it's, uh, you say it's not regulation, but if you think about the past history of Bitcoin, I mean, exchanges were banned in China, for example. Uh, yeah, you're right. Yeah, in India, and you're right. Yeah, regulatory situation in Korea is not amazing. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, if you look at look at uh, how regulators have uh, responded to to Bitcoin, you know, the SEC denied yet another uh, ETF attempt, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, you know, regulation is certainly a hurdle. Um, but uh, but but you're right. It's not all because of the regulator. And the regulator, by the way, they're doing what they have to do. They you know try to regulate. Uh, but uh, you know I think it's the product. I think uh, the product is not completely there yet. Uh, and again, because it's very new, uh, you have right. many new things that are coming into the market. Lightning uh, Network or Bitcoin and uh, proof of stake and you know lending and there are many product features that are in the market that are not that have not been yet completely integrated into current products. And typically, if you take Ledger as an example, I think we have a great product for security. We have to work on the Ledger Live experience to make it uh, much more inclusive of other services and offer uh, our customers like an end-to-end value proposition when it comes to their crypto with the same level of security, meaning that you should be able to buy, swap, stake, lend your crypto from your ledger live, from your ledger, with the same level of security, and do all of this within the ledger experience. Uh, and typically, this is what we're working on. And once we've, uh, once we will be delivering this between now and somewhere in 2020, I think uh, the ledger uh, experience and ledger live experience will be a much better experience. And so, therefore, 
and more users who could uh, could join the industry because one of the big problems that users have right now and to make this mass adoption is security. Yeah, it sounds like that you have been really tackling the security, which is, as you're saying, you know, one side of what's really important. And then there's the user experience, um, which just isn't there yet. Um, and is still somewhat cumbersome, especially for, you know, just someone who's um, like right now, when you go into Facebook, it's easy to use. Um, and so maybe they're coming at Libra from more the user experience side of things. Um, but, uh, but I did find, you know, that with Ledger, um, even with, um, you know, the technology background that I do have and, and how much I, I know about Bitcoin and, and that already, that it's still, it's not simple, easy, a, a quick process. Um, do you think that will change next year? Is that what you're, you're looking forward to? Yeah, I think we uh, we are continuously improving our product in terms of sort of usability, uh, but uh, but also you know there is an education process uh, because the market, everyone, us users, we come from a financial market that is centralized and it comes with sort of downsides and upside. But one of the upside is you know you don't handle your own security, you give it to a third party and you have insurances, etc. So right. it's very hard to lose your money. Like you know you don't. Mm-hmm open your bank account one day, it's like, poof, everything is gone. That doesn't really <laughs> right. happen. Uh, and if it was the case, then you call your bank, you call your bank, and they'll figure it out, and they'll probably reimburse you the money, I mean, them and or your insurance, etc. Yeah, this- absolutely. Like, if, if my credit card is compromised, then my bank will usually call me and let me know. And then, uh, you know, we kind of go through this process of looking at what transactions I made versus what someone else made, and then all of it's taken care of, and it's not my responsibility. Like Correct. you're saying, and so that this changes with crypto, uh, and so you know, and, and again, pros and cons. So you have your uh, freedom, you have now your money, you actually own your money, which has you know, it's uh, tons of pluses. Uh, but uh, but the downside is you have to worry about your security now, and so um, therefore you know uh, that's new, uh, and people and companies underestimate this. Which is why you know you have like so many stories of hacks and people being careless with the crypto and they put it on the, the computer hard drive and then they throw the hard drive into in, in the garbage and or you know <laughs> you know they yeah. do uh, some uh, some weird manipulation and they lose their coins as a result. Mm-hmm. So you know th- I think there is an education process and we are part of uh, of that first wave of companies trying to educate the market and offering solutions. Uh, but of course, when you do security, it comes with a certain level of uh, difficulty and clunkiness. So, what we're trying to build at Ledger, and that we I th- actually, actually, I think we've been okay in the past, and we're just trying to to do better. But is to have really good security with very good usability, and that's if you think about uh, any B two C security product, it's it's always the case. You know, it's uh, if you want real security, it's always a bit more clunkier than than if not. But uh, in crypto, security is everything. So, I would absolutely, like yeah. So why, why? Yeah. So why why do you think that is at this stage? Why is there still that little bit of clunkiness? Um, because the security has to be there um, from I think Ledger's standpoint. Um, you're helping, you know, people achieve that. Um, so why still the clunkiness? What, um, you know, why is that the case? Is it because um, to have everything sort of open and um, I guess transparent just makes it less secure? Like um, if I use my Gmail, I can then open all these other apps um, just using my own Gmail, but, but everything is now open and I guess transparent to different apps. Um, as a result, yeah, I mean, correct. I mean, if you uh, there, there are many famous attacks, like you know, Coinbase, for example, has a very uh, slick interface and it works really well. But the only thing that you have to do to clean out the Coinbase account is to copy the SIM of uh, of one user telephone, and that's uh, you know, it's not an easy attack, but it's a doable attack, and it's actually been documented many times. Yes, yeah, so it's been happening quite a bit. The the um, like the SIM hacking. Yeah, so uh, with Ledger, you cannot seem hack Ledger, uh, and there are no known attacks today where you can actually uh, extract the private keys uh, and so the funds of, of your Ledger. So if you have wealth that you're trying to protect, uh, Ledger is a more secure solution. And so 
is it is the interface of Ledger right now and the way to use Ledger as slick as to use Coinbase on your phone? No. But uh, if I have, uh, I mean, I wouldn't trust any third party with real crypto money. Right. Yeah, well, no one Actually, wants a situation. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry, sorry to cut you. But if you've seen... Uh, uh, what Kraken has said uh, recently, they actually uh, uh, tell their own customers not to leave money on their exchange. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm guessing it's not the same as, as putting it in a bank and that um, they won't be as responsible for our money as um, putting something in a bank and having our credit card compromised. Um, nobody wants a Mt. Gox situation or a Quadriga in Canada situation. Um, so if they're in fact recommending, if Kraken is recommending, um, that we be responsible for our own crypto, that, you know, that's, um, something I guess we should all think about. No, correct. But it's exactly how you say, uh, <laughs> but, but, I, but I think, you know, I think today we're in this, uh, black or white situation It's either you have your keys or you don't have your keys. Uh, and, uh, and that's the, the crypto life of today. I think tomorrow, whether it's, uh, uh, you know, everyone will sort of migrate into, um, the, the ledger kind of technology where, um, actually no one will own the keys and the keys were sort of in the middle with multiple people having access and sort of sharing the keys into, into different people, so no one has access uh, to uh, to a private key at a at a single point of time. Um, so I think even for exchanges, they will more and more morph into either having better technology to protect their coins uh, and their internal processes, uh, and or having a technology that allows user to keep their crypto uh, on their wallets uh, decentralized, but then use it very seamlessly to trade on their exchange. Oh, that's really interesting. So why do you think that that it will go that way? Is that through something like the use of lightning where the Bitcoin won't get transferred as often, perhaps? Yeah, lightning liquid, for example, is a Mm -hmm. great, uh, great example of, uh, you know, how you could have your crypto safe at any time on a hardware wallet, for example, but then uh, use uh, liquid, uh, um, but use liquid as a as a mean of a quick exchange and so you you use liquid to transfer the crypto on the exchange you do the trade and then you bring it back but there will be many other solutions in the future where your crypto will never have to leave your uh your most secure wallets and, uh, and you use smart contracts etc to sort of trade your crypto and someone will take the risk of putting the crypto on the, on a centralized exchange etc cetera, etc cetera. Oh, it's really interesting. It does sound a lot like the way banking works now where, you know, banks aren't actually moving um, cash and the settlement happens. Um, It's all, you know, digital transactions that are just um, numbers moving around as opposed to anything sort of physical moving around Um, that gets moved much less frequently. Correct. Very interesting. This is happening. You have a few companies that are actually working on this right now. And I think this is interesting. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, I hadn't, you know, sort of thought through that process, but it makes a lot of sense. Um, do you think people understand right now if you wanted to purchase something? Do people understand things in Satoshi's? Um, are there people who are purchasing things and could, you know, sort of quote how much something is in a Satoshi? No, I don't think so. <laughs> no, there's a lot of conversion still going on. But do you think that will happen in the future? Will will more things be priced in Satoshis and in Bitcoin um, rather than, you know, US dollar or pounds or other French francs? I mean, eventually, I think if if Bitcoin at some point reaches a certain stability, I think Bitcoin has a long way to go before it reaches stability. So I think a lot more money will come to the network and so forth. The price will sort of go up for the next foreseeable future. And people say that when Bitcoin will be worth, you know, 100,000 in 20 something and then a million dollar in 20 something else. I mean, I mean, who knows? But uh, but the thing is, Maybe at some point, like any other asset class, like you will reach some form of stability. Like if you take gold and, you know, you look at gold for the past 10 years compared to the dollar, it has evolved, but not by a factor of 10x. Um, And so therefore, gold is a, you know, true store of value, I would say. 
Um, and so typically to use Bitcoin as a real store of value and or uh, a medium of exchange, it needs to gain certain stability, you know, plus or minus 20% compared to other cur currencies, because otherwise, why would you take the risk? Um, yeah, absolutely. Do you think it will reach um, a stable point? Eventually, yes. I mean, I don't see why not. I mean, I don't know. Because mm -hmm. Who am I to know? But I don't see why not, because at some point, you know, what's very interesting with Bitcoin is the first time in the human history or recent human history that we are actually seeing a new class of asset being created in front of our eyes. So this is why there is so much debate around Bitcoin and what it is and what it does or doesn't do, because yeah. no, one knows. no one was here to witness the beginning of gold or, you know, right. uh, or cash or a fiat, fiat currency, etc. I mean, all these existed way before us. This is the first time that we actually see a new asset class being created. So yeah. this is why there's so much uncertainty, but uh, but there is no reason not to believe that at some point you will, uh, you know, Bitcoin itself could look like gold or something uh, that serves as a, you know, great store of value and why not a medium of exchange? I mean, it's uh, it has properties that gold doesn't have, for sure. Uh, it's difficult to pay in gold. It's very easy to pay in Bitcoin. So Right. Now, how does the volatility of the crypto market um, affect Ledger? Ledger, do you have um, products that are quoted in Bitcoin prices? Uh, no, we sell everything in euro dollars or in whatever currency uh, when people connect to Ledger.com, and you know our B two B products, we sell them in dollars or euros or you know whatever currency in, in, of our client where our client is orbiting in. Uh, we take. Bitcoin payments, but we transfer directly. I mean, we don't hold Bitcoin uh, as a store of value for, for, for Ledger because this is not our business. Hmm. <laughs> but um, uh, but yeah, I think that's, uh, that's an answer to your question, I guess. Yeah. Um, well, what do you think? Do we think, do we expect transparency from businesses nowadays? Um, or should we expect greater transparency? I think I heard you talking about that being a philosophy at Ledger. But you, you, regarding what, what do you mean? Um, I thought it was something that you had said um, in in just one of your talks about, I can't remember what it was exactly in regards to. Um, I think it had to do with um, the BSV coin and how you didn't accept it. And you were talking about your, um, that your CTO had suggested that it's something that you wouldn't accept. I mean, regarding BSV, there is a very on some replay mechanisms that they don't have and where we feel it's safe to support it but it's not a it's not a it's not a political decision on your behalf like we actually don't get involved into the crypto politics we right. technically decide whether we can support it or not based on you know uh, facts and figures and it's mainly driven by yeah, do you do you listen to the crypto community at all? Um, you know, how helpful is it when you're running a business to hear um, to hear feedback from your users? Well, no, it's amazing. That's how we designed the Nano X. Actually, most of the feedback came from our users. We just had to listen and 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 build it into a new product. And so, uh, and we listen to the crypto communities when they want a coin to be supported. You know, every time, anyway, every time we post something on Twitter, we get reminded. So, so we know. Uh, <laughs> Right. We, we know what's going on, and we try to uh, support as many communities as possible. But again, uh, if you can do it in secure environments. So, uh, so, so that's the, that's our only concern. Security is the only thing that we concerned with. We don't again, we don't decide. Uh, you know, we're not linked to any sort of politics. We are very agnostic and exhaustive to what we support with with Ledger. So, you know, Libra tomorrow, uh, Gram. Any tokens that come to the market should have uh, a ledger integration. Fantastic. And what are you most looking forward to for the future? You were talking about um, increasing or upgrading the user experience in 2020. And is there anything else that you're really excited about for the future? I mean, look, we're already trying to do many things. On the one side, we have the consumer value proposition and Ledger Live and you know all these new features that we just discussed today. On the other side, we have Ledger Vaults that we're taking to market. That is uh, an amazing value proposition for enterprises, and you know there will be sort of many announcements to be done in the future. We just announced that Bitstamp is now using our technology, so that's uh, 
Mm. That's a great move forward. And so, you know, we're going to make sure that those two value propositions are, you know, the best in class and as good as they can be in the future, integrating on top of our security, ease of use, and governance platform, many other features that allow users to really live their crypto life through uh, the Ledger platforms, whether it's Ledger Live or Ledger Vault. So that's my main preoccupation for the future to come. Uh, and uh, that's what Ledger does, yeah. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, is there anything else you wanted to add, Pascal? Otherwise, I have a few fun questions for you. Uh, no, I think I'm good. Like you, you asked me already many questions, so I, I already feel that I've spoken too much. <laughs> no, it's great. It's really helpful, useful advice. Um, well, I have five fun questions for you. Uh, so number one is, if you could swap jobs with anyone for a day, whose job would you want to try out? Uh, Donald Trump. <laughs> I'd love to see you doing Donald Trump's job. <laughs> it would be interesting being, um, are you, you're not an American citizen, I'm assuming. No, that's why. That's yeah. The, because I could be, I could be uh, Macron, but that's, that I can do, I think. Uh, Donald <laughs> Trump is impossible because I'm French, but it'd be fun <laughs> to be the president of the United States for one day. Yeah, it would be fun. <laughs> um, number two, if you could ask Satoshi one question, what would it be? And we assume Satoshi is one guy? Let's assume for this question. Are you a guy or a girl? <laughs> that would be the question. <laughs> okay. Uh, and what do you think the answer is? I don't know. Uh, that's smart. It's probably a woman. Hmm. That's, not, that's a great answer. Um, number three, what's a book on Bitcoin that you would recommend? Uh, uh, I read one that I really like. It's called Digital Gold. I think it's a uh, it's a great book to read. Uh, Digital Gold. Yeah. Yeah, I've just downloaded it. I haven't uh, listened to it yet, but I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah, what What was it that you really What got to you about that book? I really like it because it's uh, written as a novel almost, uh, mm. and it talks about like the beginning and all the teams and the Silk Road and all those uh, you know crazy stories because you know Bitcoin has been like a crazy gold rush. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's been really interesting. Um, so to, so really historical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think it's a great book for for this to really understand the beginnings and you know. Who did what, when, and why, for what reason, etc. And a lot of people that are in the book I know now. And uh, but it really, it's really the book, like the first book I would read if I am interested in crypto. To be honest. Fantastic. Well, I'm I'm really looking forward to checking it out. Um, number four, if you could sum up your life so far into like one moment, an event, or place in time, um, what would it be? Oh my God, that's such a difficult question. <laughs> uh, if I can summarize my life into one moment, one place in time. Or if there was something that was really an important moment. Oh man, the obvious answer is, you know, sort of my wife and my son, but uh, oh. one of the most important moment, I think is my son. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I think about one thing, the thing that defines you and, uh, and that wants you to become a better person. Yes, for sure. My son. Yeah. I, I do feel the same way. I think things change when you become a parent um, and you start looking at the world a little bit differently. So, um, but I feel it's the obvious answer. So I just gave you the obvious answer. <laughs> what about a non obvious answer? Is there mm -hmm. something else for either your career or your other, you know, development outside of your family? Well, defining moments. Uh, so, yes, actually, uh, I when I learn how to speak English, when and where I learn how to speak English. Oh, uh, which was where and when? I think that defined my life, my career. I mean, mm. what I have become. Um, so actually, it was 1998. It was during the French uh, Football World Cup. Uh, <laughs> and I, uh, it was so the summertime, and I took this job as a bartender in Paris in an English pub where... Everyone was British. I was the only French. And I didn't speak much English at the time, but let's say that I, I learned the hard way. Wow. Uh, and, uh, and I learned, so when people ask me, where did you learn how to speak English? I say, which is true, that I learned to speak English in a pub. <laughs> That's awesome. It's so cool. You, it's, you're forced to learn it, right? Um, oh, yeah, the, you had no choice because yeah. otherwise you couldn't make money. 
correct. And because everyone was British, they all come with a different accent. So you have to understand <laughs> and the Scottish and the Irish and the <laughs> Scottish. The, uh, oh my gosh! From the north, <laughs> right? That uh, it was quite. Oh a, my gosh! Uh, right. Wow, what a fascinating thing. And and it changed your life because you could then um, just, I guess, broaden your horizons and, you know, be, become more international yourself, I guess. Yeah, you become, you know, you become an international citizen. And also I was, you know, I like the British culture, the American culture, I mean, the Anglo-Saxon <laughs> culture in general, but you become international right away. Mm-hmm. And so in terms of meeting people everywhere in the world, like it's very rich uh, and uh, and for business. I mean, you know, I wouldn't be here on this podcast with you if I didn't speak English the Absolutely. way I know you. Absolutely. Um, and I would muddle through French and it wouldn't be so good. <laughs> um, that's wonderful. Very, very cool. And a fun story. Um, and Pascal, do you follow any special diet, uh, meat only, keto or vegan? No, I'm French. <laughs> so what is the best uh french cuisine Everything. the french cuisine i think is fantastic um but uh but what's your i guess what's your go-to french cuisine look i really you know this is the most difficult question for me because i don't do favorite things i don't have any favorite things in life i mean again, again apart from you know uh Apart from my family, because you, you you have one, so by definition they're your favorite things. But uh, mm. but for the rest, like you know, I like to keep a very open mind and try everything. So when whenever I travel, I try to eat local. Uh, and when it comes to French food, the beautiful the beauty with French food is we have so much diversity. So I wouldn't be able to pick anything, uh, whether it's uh, gastronomic food, regional food, bistronomy food. You know, we have so much going on that uh, this is my program. Actually, I, I like to try everything. Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah, I think it's incredibly important to keep an open mind. Um, you will progress in your business as you're, it sounds like you're open to suggestions and you've taken those suggestions on and you're trying to improve um, at Ledger. And also it sounds like in your life just by, you know, experiencing new things, trying new things. And yeah, I think that's, it's crucial to enjoying life as well. Mm-hmm. Love it, and you, know, and you know the French when 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 you come to Paris and you have a, you come let's say you know from the United States where you know people have moved more towards like everyone having like a different diet and yeah. you know those people when they come to Paris they feel very miserable because <laughs> you know the, the memo didn't didn't get to Paris. Or to Paris. <laughs> it's so true. <laughs> We don't know, you know, we don't know vegan, et cetera. Not, not so much. Yeah. Right. <laughs> it's true. It's true. It would be difficult to do meat only or vegan or any of these things. You're right in Paris with the, you know, the meat and the cheese and the baguette and, you know, all of that. Oh, it's wonderful. Um, and it's really horrible because if I, you, I can tell you a story. Uh, yeah. So. I, I own a restaurant actually in Paris. Like it's it's really mine and I have You do food. now? Yeah, yeah, I do. Oh wow. What's it called? It's called Istre I S T R and it's uh, uh, Rue Notre Dame de Nazareth in the third arrondissement in the Nord Marais. Amazing. And so uh, we since then we have apologized to and and and, uh, and offered dinner, etc. to 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 that lady. Uh, but uh, but to tell you how crazy it is in Paris like you know th- so the lady comes to our restaurant and she says like she's got uh, um, she's got an allergy to whatever it was and then she ordered the only dish on the on the menu that actually has the product that she has an allergy to oh no but she specifies that she wants that dish without the said product right uh, and of course our chef didn't care enough or didn't remember or, you know, <laughs> oh, because we're no. Paris, so we don't take this thing seriously. <laughs> <laughs> the problem is uh, it, you had to be taken very seriously because she had really like a, a massive allergy. So in the end, everything was okay because she had access to her medication, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, they, the, fami- the family yelled at us uh, big time and they were right to do so. So we offered dinner and, and drinks and everything. And so we, 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 uh, everyone was best friend in the end, but still <laughs> tells you that we don't do too well. With, uh, oh with my gosh. Yeah. yeah. That really does say something about, I guess the French um, <laughs> mentality around food and how, 
you know, you were saying your chef didn't really take it too seriously or didn't understand or or yeah, whatever the case. Mistake. And we're sorry and we apologize. Oh, for so reason. funny. Oh, no, that's so funny. I mean, it's terrible. She's fine, I guess. So it's OK. Now it's funny. But it's OK. Uh, I'm only telling the story because she she's OK. Yeah, right. OK. Oh, wonderful. Pascal, so great. Um, really great to chat with you today. Thank you so much for taking the time. Of course, Shannon. Thank you. It was great. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Speaking of Crypto with Shannon. If you enjoyed today's episode, please leave a review and subscribe. And for more great content and to stay up to date, visit speakingofcrypto.com and Facebook and Twitter at Speaking Crypto. We'll catch you next time.